Chapter 19, Part 1 of Volume 2 of A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Winteroud. Volume 2 of A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times by Francois Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 19. The Communes and the Third Estate. Part 1. The history of the Merovingians is that of barbarians invading Gaul and settling upon the ruins of the Roman Empire. The history of the Carlovingians is that of the greatest of the barbarians taking upon himself to resuscitate the Roman Empire, and of Charlemagne's descendants disputing among themselves for the fragments of this fabric, as fragile as it was grand. Amidst this vast chaos, and upon this double ruin, was formed the feudal system, which by transformation after transformation became ultimately France. Hugh Capet, one of its chieftains, made himself its king. The Capetians achieved the French kingship. We have traced its character and progressive development from the 11th to the 14th century through the reigns of Louis the Fat, of Philip Augustus, of Saint Louis, and of Philip the Handsome, princes very diverse and very unequal in merit, but all of them able and energetic. This period was likewise the cradle of the French nation. This was the time when it began to exhibit itself in its different elements, and to arise under monarchical rule from the midst of the feudal system. Its earliest features and its earliest efforts in the long and laborious work of its development are now to be set before the reader's eyes. The two words inscribed at the head of this chapter, the communes and the third estate, are verbal expressions for the two great facts at that time revealing that the French nation was in labor of formation. Closely connected one with the other and tending toward the same end, these two facts are, nevertheless, very diverse, and even when they have not been confounded, they have not been with sufficient clearness distinguished and characterized, each of them apart. They are diverse both in their chronological date and their social importance. The communes are the first to appear in history. They appear there as local facts, isolated one from another, often very different in point of origin, though analogous in their aim and in every case neither assuming nor pretending to assume any place in the government of the state. Local interests and rights, the special affairs of certain populations, agglomerated in certain spots, are the only objects, the only province of the communes. With this purely municipal and individual character they come to their birth, their confirmation, and their development from the 11th to the 14th century, and at the end of two centuries they enter upon their decline. They occupy far less room and make far less noise in history. It is exactly then that the third estate comes to the front and uplifts itself as a general fact, a national element, a political power. It is the successor, not the contemporary, of the communes. They contributed much towards, but did not suffice for, its formation. It drew upon other resources and was developed under other influences than those which gave existence to the communes. It has subsisted, it has gone on growing throughout the whole course of French history, and at the end of five centuries, in 1789, when the communes had for a long while sunk into languishment and political insignificance, at the moment at which France was electing her constituent assembly, the Abbe Cisse, a man of powerful rather than scrupulous mind, could say, what is the third estate? Everything. What has it hitherto been in the body politic? Nothing. What does it demand? To be something. These words contain three grave errors. In the course of government anterior to 1789, so far was the third estate from being nothing that it had been every day becoming greater and stronger. What was demanded for it in 1789 by Monsieur Sissius and his friends was not that it might become something, but that it should be everything. That was a desire beyond its right and its strength, and the very revolution, which was its own victory, proved this. 
whatever may have been the weaknesses and faults of its foes, the Third Estate had a terrible struggle to conquer them, and the struggle was so violent and so obstinate that the Third Estate was broken up therein and had to pay dearly for its triumph. At first it obtained thereby despotism instead of liberty, and when liberty returned, the Third Estate found itself confronted by twofold hostility, that of its foes under the old regimen, and that of the absolute democracy, which claimed in its turn to be everything. Outrageous claims bring about intractable opposition, and excite unbridled ambition. What there was in the words of the Abbe Sisius in 1789 was not the verity of history, it was a lying program of revolution. We have anticipated dates in order to properly characterize and explain the facts as they present themselves, by giving a glimpse of their scope and their attainment. Now that we have clearly marked the profound difference between the Third Estate and the Communes, we will return to the Communes alone, which had the priority in respect of time. We will trace the origin and the composition of the Third Estate, when we reach the period at which it will become one of the great performers in the history of France, by reason of the place it assumed and the part it played in the States General of the Kingdom. In dealing with the formation of the Communes from the 11th to the 14th century, the majority of the French historians, even Monsieur Thierry, the most original and clear-sighted of them all, often entitled this event the communal revolution. This expression hardly gives a correct idea of the fact to which it is applied. The word revolution, in the sense or at least the aspect, given to it amongst us by contemporary events, points to the overthrow of a certain regimen, and of the ideas and authority predominant thereunder, and the systematic elevation in their stead of a regimen essentially different in principle and in fact. The revolutions of our day substitute, or would fain substitute, a republic for a monarchy, a democracy for an aristocracy, political liberty for absolute power. The struggles which, from the 11th to the 14th century, gave existence to so many communes, had no such profound character. The populations did not pretend to any fundamental overthrow of the regimen they attacked, they conspired together, they swore together, as the phrase is according to the documents of the time, they rose to extricate themselves from the outrageous oppression and misery they were enduring, but not to abolish feudal sovereignty and to change the personalities of their masters. When they succeeded, they obtained those treaties of peace called charters, which brought about in the condition of the insurgents salutary changes accompanied by more or less effectual guarantees. When they failed, or when the charters were violated, the result was violent reactions, mutual excesses, the relations between the populations and their lords were tempestuous and full of vicissitudes, but at bottom neither the political regimen nor the social system of the communes was altered. And so there were, at many spots, without any connection between them, local revolts and civil wars, but no communal revolution. One of the earliest facts of this kind, which have been brought forth with some detail in history, clearly shows their primitive character. A fact the more remarkable in that the revolt described by the chroniclers originated and ran its course in the country among peasants with a view of recovering complete independence, but not amongst an urban population with a view of resulting in the erection of a commune. Toward the end of the tenth century, under Richard II, Duke of Normandy, called the Good, and whilst the good King Robert was reigning in France, in several courtships of Normandy, says William of Jumieges, all the peasants, assembling in their conventicles, resolved to live according to their inclinations and their own laws, as well in the interior of the forest as along the rivers, and to reck naught of any established right. To carry out this purpose, these mobs of madmen chose each two deputies, who were to form at some central point an assembly charged to see the execution of their decrees. As soon as the Duke, Richard II, was informed thereof, he sent a large body of men-at-arms to repress this audaciousness of the county districts and to scatter this rustic assemblage. In execution of his orders, the deputies of the peasants and many other rebels were forthwith arrested, their feet and hands were cut off, 
and they were sent away thus mutilated to their homes in order to deter their like from such enterprises and to make them wiser for fear of worse. After this experience, the peasants left off their meetings and returned to their plows. It was about eighty years after the event when the monk William of Jumiege told the story of this insurrection of peasants so long anterior, and yet so similar to that which more than three centuries afterwards broke out in nearly the whole of northern France, and which was called the Jacquere. Less than a century after William of Jumiege, a Norman poet, Robert Wace, told the same story in his Romance of Rue, a history and verse of Rollo and the first dukes of Normandy. The lords do us naught but ill, he makes the Roman peasants say, with them we have nor gain nor profit from our labors, every day is for us a day of suffering, of travail and of fatigue, every day our beasts are taken from us for forced labor and services, why put up with all this evil, and why not get quit of travail? Are we not men even as they are? Have we not the same stature, the same limbs, the same strength for suffering? Bind we ourselves by oath, swear we to aid one another, and if they be minded to make war on us, have we not for every night thirty or forty young peasants ready and willing to fight with club or boar spear or arrow or axe or stones, if they have not arms? Learn we to resist the knights, and we shall be free to hew down trees, to hunt game, and to fish after our fashion, and we shall work our will on flood and in field and wood. These two passages have already been quoted in chapter 14 of this history, in the course of describing the general condition of France under the Capetians before the Crusades, and they are again brought forward here because they express and paint to the life the chief cause which formed the end of the tenth century led to so many insurrections among the rural as well as urban populations, and brought about the establishment of so many communes. We say the chief cause only, because oppression and insurrection were not the sole origin of the communes. Evil, moral and material, abounds in human communities, but it never has the sole dominion there. Force never drives justice into utter banishment, and the ruffianly violence of the strong never stifles in all hearts every sympathy for the weak. Two causes, quite distinct from feudal opposition, viz. Roman traditions and Christian sentiments, had their share in the formation of the communes and in the beneficial results thereof. The Roman municipal regimen, which is described in M. Guizot's L'Essai sur l'Histoire de France, first essay, pages 1 through 44, did not everywhere perish with the empire. It kept its footing in a great number of towns, especially in those of southern Gaul, Marseille, Arles, Nîmes, Narbonne, Toulouse, etc. At Arles, the municipality actually bore the name of commune, communitas. Toulouse gave her principal magistrates the name of capitals, after the capital of Rome, and in the greater part of the other towns in the south, they were called consuls. After the great invasion of barbarians, from the 7th to the end of the 11th centuries, the existence of these Roman municipalities appears but rarely and confusedly in history. But in this there is nothing peculiar to the towns and the municipal system, for confusion and obscurity were at that time universal, and the nascent feudal system was plunged therein as well as the dying little municipal systems were. Many Roman municipalities were still subsisting without influencing any event, of at all a general kind, and without leaving any trace. And as the feudal system grew and grew, they still went on in the midst of universal darkness and anarchy. They had penetrated into the north of Gaul in fewer numbers, and with a weaker organization than in the south, but still keeping their footing and vaunting themselves on their Roman origin in the face of their barbaric conquerors. The inhabitants of Reim remembered with pride that their municipal magistracy and its jurisdiction were anterior to Clovis, dating as they did from before the days of St. Remigius, the apostle of the Franks. The burghers of Metz boasted of having enjoyed civil rights before there was any district of Lorraine. Lorraine, says they, is young, and Metz is old. 
the city of Bourges was one of the most complete examples of successive transformations and denominations attained by a Roman municipality from the 6th to the 13th century under the Merovingians, the Carolingians, and the earliest Capetians. At the time of the invasion it had arenas, an amphitheater, and all that characterized a Roman city. In the 7th century, the author of the life of St. Estadiola, born at Bourges, says that she was the child of illustrious parents who, as worldly dignity is accounted, were notable by reason of senatorial rank, and Gregory of Tours quotes a judgment delivered by the principles, primores, of the city of Bourges. Coins of the time of Charles the Bald are struck with the name of the city of Bourges and its inhabitants, Bitorige. In 1107, under Philip I, the members of the municipal city of Bourges are named Prudhomme. In two charters, one of Louis the Young in 1145, and the other of Philip Augustus in 1218, the old senators of Bourges have the name at one time of Bonhomme, at another of Baron of the city. Under different names, in accordance with change of language, the Roman municipal regimen held on and adapted itself to new social conditions. End of chapter 19, part 1 Recording by Alan Winteroud, boomcoach.blogspot.com